Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Historically Black Sense, which is the premier digital platform for all things HBCU and D9 organization. Today, we have a very, very special guest on with us. And I'm glad that he took the time out to sit down because when you hear um, this guy's introduction as well as title, You'll see why I said it. He seems to be a very, very busy man. Um, <laughs> anyway, without further ado, I would like to, to welcome Mr. Mark A. Brown. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. I I, uh, I learned a little bit about your show, so it's it's a privilege to be here. Hey, thank you. Thank you. That, that means a lot. That means a lot. So, uh, Mr. Mark A. Brown, and I have to read this one. I try to memorize it, but it's so much. <laughs> um the director, the executive director of the Student Freedom Initiative, um, which was founded by Mr. Robert A. Smith. Um, and we all, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute of who exactly that is and how you all connected. Um, you are accountable to the Board of Directors for Leadership, Guidance and Direction, Business Development, and Strategic Communications. Okay, now, before I got on here, people, I want y'all to know I asked him, should I address him as Mr. or Major General? Because <laughs> he has a lot of titles. Um, now, with the case study of African Americans and the student loan crisis, Major General Brown holds the board membership of many professional and service organizations, including the Board of Trustees, Air Force Aid Society, Life Member Air Force Association, American Society and Military Com Com Controllers, for the, former, <clears throat> the former board member, Knowledge Works, the Airlift Tanker Association, Riverside Military Academy, Operation Gratitude, and Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Now, sir, that is a, that, that is a lot. Um, I've read something about Troy University. I have even went down to Tuskegee University, which is right down our alley. So I want to get started first with Tuskegee University. Uh, being that this, this is the AA platform for HBCUs as well as D9 organizations, I want to start there, if you don't mind. Tuskegee University, at what point did you decide to go to Tuskegee University? Um, I see that you went for accounting, um, which is something that is way out of my arena. <laughs> so if you can, please talk to us a little bit about that. Well, so, you know, I think uh, I'll start big and go little. First, first of okay. all... Historically, black college and university, right? Um, and we have over 100 of them to pick from. And uh, they are so special. They're a jewel to our nation, I believe. I believe they're special to our nation. They were there for us uh, when, when we were not allowed to go to other schools. They stood up for the purpose of educating us when an education had been denied to us. And they did so with fewer resources uh, than their counterparts got. So, so we all owe... A, a, a deep sense of gratitude, I think, for HBCUs. And, and we know what they produce for our nation uh, across the country. As for Tuskegee, uh, I went to Tuskegee with, uh, with the thought of becoming an Air Force officer. You know, out of all, there's lots of, there's lots of history with all of our HBCUs. One of the things that's associated with uh, Tuskegee Institute at the time, to later be called Tuskegee University, was that it was the proving ground uh, that men of color could fly aircraft. When, when some scientists believed that men of color could not fly aircraft, uh, a group called the Tuskegee Airmen proved that to be totally false. Uh, they went out to a place called Moton Field. Uh, you get there on your way back from Alabama State. If you're going down the highway, you'll pass down Moton Field. And they proved to a president uh, that they had the right to fight. Uh, and then when they did so, they did so with all kind of heroic-ism uh, that you can now find in the history books. That was inspiring to me as a young person uh, wanting to come into the Air Force, uh, and Tuskegee was a great place to do it. So that got me there. The Air Force paid for me to be there. And then, frankly, I fell in love with it once I was on the yard of the Tuskegee Golden Tigers. Mm, that's very interesting. Now, how long did you serve in the Air Force? So I served for 32 years. Um, so... Um, you know, I came in for four, uh, and I was about 28 years past that. In, in oh, wow. Out. Because I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I, I loved it. And I think important to our audience, uh, the foundation that I got at Tuskegee allowed me to serve uh, what some would argue is successfully uh, for 32 years. 
Wow, 32 years is um, definitely a long time. Uh, but I guess it's not when you're having fun because you definitely, you super exceeded four years. <laughs> that's right. So that, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Um, so what I kind of want to get into, I'm going to skip around a little bit. So this won't be in sure. order of, you know, your life timeline. Sure. sure. Um, let's get into it. Executive Director of Student, Student Freedom Initiative. How did that manage to come about? Because as I'm reading that, um, and I don't really want to give it away. I've done my research and I tell people, anyone who comes on the show, I've done my research, but I like for you to present it to the audience the way that you would like to be in that you know it's so in depth and you, you, I mean, you know it from an internal standpoint versus myself of just actually reading it off of a paper or reading it off of a, of a, of a website. So how did that come about? And it was founded by Mr. Uh, Mr. Robert Smith. Um, and my first, my first introduction to him was like a lot of people, and I'm I'm just being honest that it was at that Morehouse commencement ceremony when he right. pledged to um, pay off a, a tremendous amount of student loan debt for those graduating for those graduating young men, and. You know, I'm like, who, who is this guy? Uh, let me do some research myself on him. And so fast forward to today or, you know, maybe early in the week, last week when I when I, you know, actually got your breakdown of everything and I'm reading and I'm saying, OK, so these two are actually connected. How did that come about? How did you come in contact with him? How did he come in contact with you? And how did you actually just become the executive director of, of, of SFI? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think you you nailed it right. So so there was no student freedom initiative uh, when the class of 2019 at Morehouse College uh, chose Robert F. Smith to be their graduation speaker. Wise choice, right? So during his Why? speech, he suddenly says, "I'm going to put some fuel in the tank of you graduates. You're going to be my class. I'm going to pay off all of your student loans." And by that, he meant your student loans, your Parent Plus loans, all of the loans that you had. He was a man of his word. He went out and he did that. There were 400 graduates. Not all of them have student loans. But at the end of the day, it was a $38 million bill. Uh, and he paid it off. When he did that, I was at the Department of Education. I had been retired from the Air Force for a couple of years. I was the chief operating officer uh, appointed uh, to be that by the Secretary of Education. Uh, I had the whole student loan portfolio for the nation. That was my job, the entire student loan portfolio for the nation. That's $1.7 trillion. Uh, everybody talks about the student loan crisis for giving student loans. If you look at the whole thing, it's $1.7 trillion. Everybody knows the big number. What they don't know is that one third of that, 33% of that $1.7 trillion is defaulted, delinquent, somehow distressed, hadn't been touched in over a year. And here's the disruptive part, when you uniquely in that. In that one third, overrepresented by people that look like you and I. Uh, and looked like those students that were about to graduate uh, that Robert freed, essentially, from that debt trap when he paid off their student loans. But he's a man of vision. I will tell you, he is a man of vision. You don't get to be the CEO and founder of companies like Vista Equity unless you're a man of vision. And he said, this is not nearly enough. Morehouse is one school. Uh, there are over 100 historically black colleges and universities in the nation. I'll bet you every graduating class has a student loan debt and a framework similar to what I found at Morehouse. He said that because we know in the nation that the wealth gap in America between people of color and their white counterparts is, has not changed very much. There's a significant difference. There's a 5x difference in how much wealth they have. And so what Robert said at that time was, we need to do something to fix this in perpetuity. We need to fix it forever. Now, he can't go riding around to every graduation and write a check for everybody who's graduating every year. But we need to come up with some kind of systemic way so that when guys like you and I graduate from college, after we work hard, first-generation college students sometimes, work hard, four years. You're coming out of Alabama. You know what I'm talking about, right? There are students, yes, their parents are doing everything they can to get them through college. They, they, they sign loans. They do all kinds of things. And then that son or daughter graduates. And they're strapped with college debt. Instead of going out and investing and building wealth and making it better for their family, they're paying off debt for 20, 30 years. Robert wanted to do something about that. 
Uh, I left the Department of Education at their request. I became the executive director of Student Freedom Initiative. We started this 501c organization. It started with nine uh, schools. Now it has 53, and we're continuing to grow with the purpose of providing an alternative to some students that would otherwise be caught in debt, and then providing services that would help keep them in school. That's what we do. That's how I became involved in it. That's what we're on the ground doing every day in this nonprofit organization, is we're providing a structure uh, by which these students will have an alternative uh, to their normal uh, student loan debt. Wow. Um, that is definitely a vision, first and foremost. Uh, and it's funny that you say, yeah, he can't ride around. <laughs> no one can ride around just writing checks, getting rid of student loan debt for different graduating classes. Um, that would be a healthy, healthy check. <laughs> a healthy check. Um, so for, for you personally, is it anyone who you know? Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't know this this side of your life. However, maybe a cousin, maybe a nephew or a niece, or maybe even a, a, a child of yours, perhaps, that has had student loans that you know of. I guess that you know of um, that you actually know the feeling personally of it. Because it's one thing to say, okay, well, yeah, I'm on the board. I'm the executive director. I see it. I know a lot of kids have student loans, a lot of a lot of young men, a lot of young women coming out of college, but has it personally ever hit home to you where you're like, okay, well, I know all about this. This has hit home. So this makes me being the executive director even more, it's, it's even more pur uh, purposeful. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they're related to me. Uh, they, they're in my neighborhoods. They're at school with me, right? I, I, of course, I know... I know lots of people who have been strapped with student loan debt uh, in the past and currently today. I would argue that if you're a man of color in America, I'll bet you know somebody that's strapped with student loan debt. I would be surprised if you did not know someone strapped Absolutely. with student loan debt. You know, the purposes of, of, of student loans are in what's called Title IV in the Department of Education budget. It dates all the way back to 1965. And when they did it, they said, look, we believe that a loan can provide a hand up, not just a loan, help to get to college, Pell Grants, all of those things can help a certain segment of society catch up with the other part of, of society. Said differently, social and economic mobility. We, this was what that was supposed to do. Now, it turns out that the loan is the wrong instrument to do that with. Now, but that's, that was the intent. And do I know anyone? Look, I remember uh, a, 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 uh, a roommate, and I'll just call him a roommate, in, uh, in, in school. Smart enough to be an engineering major at, at Tuskegee. Uh, but not enough money to come back uh, the junior year. Oh. Now, think about this. Think about this kind oh. of investment, right? Uh, we don't have enough engineers uh, of color in the country. Uh, the, 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 the country, if you look at the Census Bureau, uh, there are more and more people of color uh, in the country. And one day, what is now a minority may be a majority. Some of what that now minority, perhaps future majority, needs to do is to be able to contribute to the building of the nation. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics majors participate greatly in that. That roommate of mine had all the talent and all the intellect to get an engineering degree, but not the money. You see, you see the, the loss to the nation, not the loss to him personally, not the loss to him personally. Sure, there's what, but do you see the loss to the nation? That's what, we're, that's what we're saying. What we're saying is, look, if you're a junior, a senior at a historically black college or university, if you're majoring in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, any of those things, and you get up, you get a Pell Grant, this is how it works, right? Pell Grant, 20 hours work study, you get that first kind of Perkins loan where you don't need your parents' signature. If you get all of that and you still have a gap in college, and most do, sometimes between eleven and fifteen thousand, and they saw and you and you're offered a parent plus loan, we're saying don't take it. We'll give you up to twenty thousand dollars per academic year, uh, so that you don't have to drop out of college, nor do you have to go to the debt trap of the parent plus loan system, because we know sixty three percent of HBCU students use parent plus loans. It, it defaults at five times the rate 
as other loans defaults. So you know what that does to our credit. And the debt is held twice as long. So here's what we say. Don't indebt your parents further. If your parents are living on $30,000 a year with three kids, a loan is not what they need to help them out. Right. So don't do that. Take an income contingent agreement. If you go and you work and you make $80,000 a year, you'll pay that back at 2.5 percent of your income and, and to the degree that you uh, needed it. Uh, if you go to grad school, you won't pay it for. If you go and teach uh, or you go in the military and you do something that has you making less than $30,000 a year, 230 percent of poverty level, uh, you won't pay during that time. But here's the here's the key, Daryl. Just one one key to that. You're not paying us. You're paying into a fund that becomes an endowment for all of those HBCUs so that all of the students that come in later will never have to go to that debt trap again. They'll always be able to get income contingent agreements because we're going to build that fund large enough to sustain them. And so when Robert Smith says in perpetuity, when he says do it and fix it forever, that's his guidance. That's what he's talking about, because an endowment is the single best sign of wealth of a school. The endowment in an Ivy League school, the smallest one we could find was $2.9 billion. We added up the endowment of 70% of HBCUs, like the one you went to and the one I went to. And we still didn't get $2.9 billion. So let's say that you're at Brown University and you're a chemical engineering major. I'm at uh, Tuskegee and I'm a chemical engineering major. You have a 4.0. I have a 4.0 in chemical engineering. DuPont wants to hire both of us because we're doing good. I get uh, three years worth of Parent PLUS loans. You get an endowed scholarship to close the gap on your college. You don't have the debt when you come out. We both make $70,000 a year. Whose wealth is going to grow the quickest? Yours is going to grow the quickest. The wealth gap in America continues because of how I got wow. my education. You follow me? That's what we're trying to do. The wealth gap in America through the lens of education. I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that you broke it down to me that way. And that once again, that's that's another reason why instead of me trying to go into it and ask specific questions to you, I feel like th this is not an interview. This is more of a conversation. Um, because I'm actually learning because that's something that I never would have guessed. A lot of people, I'm one of those people, I would feel like, hey, I'm just paying this back. I never would think that it's going into this into this uh, actual pool, if you will, to actually help, like you stated, like you stated, in, in uh, perpetuity. So it's not actually going right back to you all, which I feel like is amazing. Um, so it's, it's definitely different than just going to get into that, that debt hold, as you speak of, as far as the parent plus loans. I totally get it. I never knew it. I'm glad that we're having this sit, this, uh, this sit down right now. <laughs> right. right. Okay. Can we talk about the, let's talk about the help program for a minute. Um, handling everyday life problems for students. Now yeah. I feel like that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, however, once again, as I'm reading and as I have read, I feel like it's, it goes way more in debt than even I know. So can you talk to me about that just a little bit? I can. Let me start by saying that we're grateful that companies like Prudential uh, and other industries underwrite our programs. In the, in the case of the one that we're talking about now, Prudential uh, right. underwrites what we call, in short, the HELPS program. And you're right, handling everyday life problems for students. Again, if you've been on an HBCU campus, or I would argue many college campuses, uh, what is it that takes a student off their trajectory to graduation? And let's set tuition aside for a time. A parent died and I have to go back home. Um, things like that. The tires went bad on my car. There was a flood, right? Uh, or I'm in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and the water is bad, right? And it, it disrupts me from my educational journey, right? Just think about that. And because it disrupts me from my educational journey and I already come from a fragile economic background, I, I'm, I'm out of school. I may never go back, right? Which is a sad story, but true. That has nothing to do with my academic abilities, has nothing to do with tuition. It's that I start in this fragile economic background and I can't bounce back from those things that throw me off just a little bit. Handling everyday life problems for students is all about overcoming that issue and then getting back in the saddle and persisting to graduation. So here's what we do. Grant, meaning you don't pay the money back. Someone just gives it to you. It's a grant. We grant a student uh, in an emergency that's non-tuition related, 
up to five hundred dollars uh, to to help take care of that emergency. We have students that are taking these all over our portfolio. Uh, we pay the first seventy five percent, and then the school pays at least the next twenty five percent, and perhaps more if they want to. But what we're really trying to do is say, look, it rained, it, it, you got a flood in your apartment. We're going to help you get back on your feet so you can continue the graduation. The, the camera doesn't work on your computer. You can't do virtual learning. Don't quit school. Let me fix the computer. Get back and persist the graduation. Someone died at home. You got to get a round trip ticket home. You have things you got to do. Let us help you through this situation so that you can persist the graduation. Uh, we've issued these all across uh, the HBCUs that we've serviced. You can imagine the students applying for them. Uh, and and getting them. Uh, we're, we're able to do that because of the generous ph uh, philanthropic efforts of companies like Prudential. Mm. I wish there was something that was around when I was in college, um, simply because that is just what it says in the title. Um, we all are faced with, you know, different, different trials and, you know, whatever the case may be throughout the course of college. Um, and like you said, if you don't have a certain amount of support back at home or that backup fund or whatever the case may be, a lot of people, we're just, you know, they're just stuck out there in the mud. They just stuck out there in the mud with no way to get out of it. That's and right. that's something um, that I feel like is a is definitely a great program, um, which is why we're having this conversation, as I call it once again, because people aren't aware of things like that. They don't understand or, or know that, hey, it's help right here at your fingertips you know, reach out because we all have issues and we all have hurdles that we have to overcome. And a lot of times it does deter a person from finishing college because once that financial mindset kicks in, you know, it, it kind of deters everything else and it discourages, uh, discourages you and everything else in the world. So I feel like the health, pro the health program is definitely something that is great. And when we post this interview, I'm definitely going to pinpoint that because I know a lot of people really, really need that. Yeah. Um, so let, let's move right along a little, uh, a little bit further. The Student Freedom Agreement, right? Um, which is which is you know kind of talk a little bit about it, but can we kind of reiterate that just a little bit and get back into it? The Student Freedom Agreement. Yeah, yeah that's the alternative, right? The Student Freedom Agreement today is for juniors and seniors majoring in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as determined by their school, making satisfactory academic progress. They made it to their junior year. Right. They're, they're eligible at their junior year uh, when they get their financial aid award package uh, and it stacks up. If they get past the first unsecured loan, like the Perkins loan, and they need another one, uh, we offer an alternative to those other loans, parent plus loans and private loans. Now, why do we provide an alternative? Because that particular instrument out of all the instruments that that you can get seems to fail our community the most. Uh, and, and I gave the example, but I really want our audience to think about this. The government's intent is to be helpful. I don't think this is a good guy and bad guy. I think the government's intent is to be helpful, but it's having the opposite effect. So a family that is living in poverty and has uh, qualified for every one of those financial benefits may still have a, a cost of college gap. Student needs to get registered. Many of the students don't really get to this point if they get on a payment plan until they are just before needing to complete that semester and register for the next semester. And, the, and then the bursar or the financial aid office says, you can't be able to take your final exams. You won't be able to register the next semester unless you pay off this balance. The financial aid counselor doing what they do would say, take a parent plus loan. If you get your parents to sign this, you can do it. Now, this is the same parent that's living in poverty, but if they qualify, which means not a lot of derogatory things on their credit, although they don't have a lot of income, they can get that parent plus loan. Will, in our community, will that parent sign the promissory note so that that student can continue on in college? Oh yeah, oh yeah, first generation without, college. Without a doubt. My child's at college. I went to the front of the church and told them, my boy's our daughter's going to school, right? This is how it works in our community. We know this, right? We know how proud we are. We're going to sign anything. You, I want them to graduate. They sign the promissory note. The debt uh, comes back. They can't afford to pay it. It drags them down. It drags the credit down of their new graduate. Uh, and it has the opposite effect of what that education was supposed to do. What we say is, wait, there's an alternative. 
We would better, we would rather bet on the future of this highly qualified student about to graduate uh, than to further take his family down in debt. And that's when the student freedom agreement is offered to that student. And what we say is 2.5% uh, of your income uh, uh, for every 10,000 that you take out. Uh, it won't exceed 40,000 and it won't exceed 20 years because either way we're going to end it at that time. And let's say you took out 8,000, you would be probably done in six or seven years. But the trick is what you and I talked about earlier. For the first time, we're going to take care of ourselves. We're not paying, and I won't name any of the banks, but we're not paying any of the banks. We're not paying any of the folks. Uh, we're not even paying the federal government. We're going to put it back in the coffers of the historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we're going to call on industry to provide donations. We're going to um, uh, also have access to low, cap low interest to no interest capital, and we're going to get some payments back. We're going to grow the fund large enough that when that student pays back, he's paying back the next graduate and the next graduate and the next graduate. It's a beautiful thing when you think about us investing in ourselves and building this fund for ourselves collectively uh, that will give us a brighter future. It, it is. It's definitely, it, it's like a revolving door, if you will. Um, <laughs> we say revolving, you know, but you got it exactly right. There you go. And I, and, and um, personally, I would be more comfortable, you know, whether it was in my college career or whatever the case may be, barring anything in life. <laughs> if I knew that what I was paying back was going to something other than a bank or, you know, like you say, we won't call it certain names, but if I know it's going back into a pool to help other people just like myself, right? to me, that's a that's an initiative to even pay it back even further because you know it's going to help someone that was that's going to be in that same position that you are in or that you were in rather so that's i right. think i think that's a that's that's an amazing thing um so i want to switch the gears last time you've been back to alabama state and walked across the campus in sep september was it september september a few months ago <laughs> a few months ago you saw the kids there right I did. The students there, and you're from I Alabama. Did. So if yes, you sir. were if you were out now and you had taken an income contingent agreement and it was time to make the payments back because you were doing well, you were making however much thousand dollars a year, wouldn't you feel okay if you knew that the funds you were going back to, those same kids you saw walking around the campus, was going to give them an opportunity to stay out of debt and do the same thing that you did? Isn't that better than paying a faceless institution or a, a faceless loan company? that uh, you know, you're just paying into something that you isn't, are indebted to do. And, and you, don't, you don't know, I mean, we, we supposed to know where it's going. However, let's be real. A lot of times, <laughs> you know, we don't, but to know exactly where it's going, I think that that is amazing. I feel like honestly, that, that's amazing. And that's for lack of a better term. I haven't heard of any other program like this. Um, just being honest. I believe I it's unique. I believe it's unique. And look, look, uh, I'm not trying to uh, discredit any of the many people that are trying to do good things. Uh, but a, 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 if I provide you a scholarship, I take care of you, the individual. Uh, if I provide you a grant, I take care of you, the individual. If I provide you a fund that revolves around, I take care of many. What we tell people is if, if you pay $10 million into this fund as a company, uh, and I'll give you a company that has done same things like that, then you're going to pay for 100 STEM students every year forever, given our, given our fund. That one $10 million keeps on giving. It's the gift that keeps on giving. So when Cisco, one of our partners, one of our corporate partners is Cisco, uh, and uh, they donated $150 million, but $50 million of it was cash, and $100 million was in kind. That $50 million, for every 10 of that $50 million, 100 million STEM students will be going to school in perpetuity. 100 wow. times 10 is 5. So, so how many? 500 students every year forever. That's the, that's the theory of our fund, and that's how the fund is modeled. That's, it is unique. It is unique because we're, we're taking Robert's guidance. Don't fix it for one class. Don't fix it for one year. Fix it in perpetuity forever. Um, 
and 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 I feel like that was a, that was something that um it makes the people a lot of people not feel left out because there were so many people that were like, oh man, I wish I was in their graduating class at Morehouse, yada yada. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool, that's great. They 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 were in the right place at the right time. <laughs> um, however, I'm glad that he took it a step further, and now that you you all are taking it a step further, and it's helping others, so other people don't have to say, well. I mean, you know, they may not have been in their particular graduating class, but the people coming up now, it's like, okay, well, I know I don't have to be in this crazy strain of finances trying to get through college. And it'll, it'll really have some relief. And even paying that particular portion back over the years, once again, it's going back to help someone else, just as uh, Mr. Robert Smith did help that particular class. It may not be in that same entity or that same, you know, in the same capacity, but it's still helping. And I feel like that's the thing. We're giving back to us, and that's what I'm definitely getting from this interview, and I, and I love it because we're giving back to us. We're taking care of us, as you said in the beginning of the interview. Yeah. And that's something that we haven't done. Once again, I, I'll say it again. I haven't heard of any program such as this. So I think it's very unique. I think it's very great what you all are doing. Um, I'm going to switch gears one more time. Once okay. again, I'm going to be respectful of your time, so I'm going to put this on a lighter note. Um, you're, you're pretty familiar with uh, Greek life as well, correct? I am. I am. <laughs> okay. Um, if I recall, a, a man of black and gold. Um, that's right, black and old gold. But you got black it. and old gold. Let me get it right, black and old gold. <laughs> uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Right. Okay. Um, at what point? Well, let me let me ask you this way: Did you choose Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, or did Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated choose you? <laughs> Well, let me uh, let me start by saying all of our all of the members of the Divine Nine, I can say, and probably greater than that, have made uh, amazing contributions. Right. You know, I I said earlier that uh, HBCUs were there for us um, uh, when others uh, were not there for us for for systemic reasons and reasons that are part of our history. That's that's a that's a fact. That's a historical fact. Uh, but it's also a historical fact. Uh, that uh, fraternities were not always uh, there for us. Uh, and when there were no fraternities for us uh, and a group of men at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, decided that they were going to finish school, they were going to bind together and study. Uh, they were going to believe in what they were there for. And these were young adult men. Uh, and, and it was not too many years after slavery. And they started a study club. And that study club has evolved into the oldest black Greek letter uh, fraternity uh, in the world today, and that's Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and many other uh, uh, historically uh, black fraternities uh, like Phi Beta Sigma and Omega Psi Phi and Kappa Alpha Psi, and I could go on, but you know them all. Uh, the Divine Nine have come to be. For me, uh, there, there, I didn't come from a family of fraternity members, or could not have told you two things about any fraternity when I arrived at Tuskegee as a freshman. It was not a part of my background, not something I learned about. Uh, there was a president at Tuskegee, the late Benjamin F. Payton uh, was the president when I was there. Uh, he was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. Uh, so was a dean. Uh, so was the local judge. Uh, so was several of my instructors. And so uh, as I learned uh, about these fraternities, because if you're on an HBCU campus, you begin to learn them. Uh, I aspired to be like those people more so than the fraternity. I wanted to be like them. They seemed to be the leaders on the campus. They seemed to be uh, men that were serious minded. Uh, and so uh, in the old days, we took a, a flyer and we stuck it on the wall of the dormitory and we said, there's a smoker. Uh, and if you want to come by, the smoker was the term they used, come by and learn. And that's how I was introduced to Alpha Phi Alpha. I went to the smoker and I came by and I learned. But here's what I will tell you. Uh, the fraternity, and I don't, I, don't, I don't limit this to the one that I'm in, have also provided an avenue uh, for men and women of color to bind, to, to, to be brothers and sisters, to have common beliefs, uh, to socialize, uh, and to be a, a professional networking organization as well. So, yeah, that's how I became a member of the Black and Old Goal. Uh, still an active member, uh, incredibly proud of it, uh, but also proud of my other brothers and sisters in the Divine Eye. Okay, hey, hey, I like that. That sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I, I had to sneak that in there because I, I couldn't leave that out, being that this is about HBCUs as well as D9 organizations. Um, 
<laughs> so definitely also shout out to the members of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that we had a chance to sit down and, and talk. I'm glad that you had a chance to spread some insight because I've said this before to certain Darryl, people. can I ask you one quick question? Absolutely. I know you asked the questions, but can I ask you one quick one? Absolutely. What member of the Black Greek Lettered Fraternities are you a member of? A member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. I ask that because I have two nephews that are members of Phi Beta Sigma, and they will appreciate that. So, here you go. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. Um, I, I feel when it comes to finances and going to going to college, uh, higher education, I've always felt deep down that we were taught to, you know, early on is go to college. Um, if you go to school, you know, get your, get your diploma, then go to college, get your degree, get you a good job, and be on your merry way and live a great life. However, I feel like that's, I always call it the American dream that people want us to, to I guess, visualize doing and, and just go right after. However, I don't think that people understand, um, and, and I'm kind of, you know, just reiterating what you said in my own way. I don't think people understand that. <laughs> a lot of times you may go to college and you get that degree and you're paying for a degree from those student loans that you're supposed to be living this great life with. However, it's like, okay, I'm going, I'm paying to go to school to get, and it's, it's more than a piece of paper, but I'm going to call it that. We're going to school to get a piece of paper that we're about to spend so much money paying for. And a lot of times we come out of college, we don't even have, um, we either underqualified for a lot of jobs or overqualified for a lot of different jobs sometimes. And we're not getting jobs in our fields. And it's like, we're in this whole thing of debt. And I feel like that makes a lot of people discouraged about even going to school in the first place now, because it's like, all right, well, hey, I'm about to go spend how much money on getting my diploma or my, I mean, my degree when I can, you know, in my opinion, I feel like it's a lot of different things that can be done as well. Like you went to the military, um, but since we're talking about school, I'll, I'll keep it on that. You know, I do feel like there's alternatives of starting your own business. I, with the amount of student loans that some people have, you can start your own business and just create generational wealth with that money that you're paying back for that degree. Um, yeah. The military is, can be a great option for those who, you know, for those who want to go to the military. I feel like let them, uh, the military will pay for your school most of the time, if I'm if I'm correct. Um yeah. You know, I feel like there's a lot of alternatives, but I feel like we go to school to pay for a piece of paper and we're paying with these with this great job that we're supposed to have that we don't have. Right. Um, you know, not 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 career. I'm gonna say job. Right. <laughs> and a lot of times we're coming out, we're getting jobs. And once again, I feel like it's great what you all are doing because it's like you're changing the narrative of that. And there's is actual real help. Right. And it's giving you the opportunity to help someone else. So you're not going in this crazy debt and you feel like, why have I just paid for this piece of paper that I'm not using? And if I do use it, I'm not making enough to even pay my bills nor pay them people back. And I'm going to say them people. I'm being real country right now <laughs> to pay them people back. Um, and I've always I've always thought that. So yeah. if I'm wrong, please correct me. But I feel like I I'm, I'm in the right I hear you now. I hear you. Let's mm -hmm. let's let's just boil it down. I mean. People philosophize about why they go to college or why kids should go to college. But let me tell you, uh, we have a very practical approach to it at Student Freedom Initiative. You go to college not to get a job, to get a good job. And college is your first major investment, right? You're investing in yourself. It needs to result in a good job. If, it, if it's not going to result in a good job, I'm not certain why you do it. Now, some people may disagree, but that's our philosophy. Let me give you an example. Inside of our program, if you're out on our website, studentfreedominitiative.org, which I encourage people to go to, you run into a platform that we suggest called Intern XL. Intern XL. It's like Indeed, which is a jobs platform. But Intern XL is like Indeed for HBCU students. We've got mm. to date about 17,000 students on there. We've got about 200 Fortune 500 companies. But we asked these Fortune 500 companies to do a pledge, right, to say, I will provide only paid internships because the demographic that we're working with, they're not working for free anymore. They need to, they need to be paid, that they will have a stretch assignment, 
that they'll have some visibility of the C-suite, right? In other words, find a job and find a job early and one that matches both what the company wants and what you want early, like in sophomore year. Our, our goal is that every one of the folks in our program will have at least two paid internships before graduation. The platform itself, the intern Excel platform, if you think about the system, has over 80 learning management systems self-paced, where you can go in and get a cloud-based certification, an IT certification, various certifications associated with Cisco. And, and why are those certifications on there? Because industry said that's what they need. And so what we're looking to do is to make a match between the student and an industry they want to work in as early as possible. This is for all academic majors, not just STEM majors, all academic majors. Two paid internships. We follow the data. A paid internship student is about 63% more likely to get a job in the industry they interned in or the, the job that they're looking for. And so it's about internships, right? It's about early internships. This is a part of our platform because I couldn't agree with you more, right? No one is going to school just to say they got a degree, right? If a, if a kid... If a kid comes from Selma, Alabama, and their parents get them to school, do you think they just want to brag because they got a sheet of paper? Or do you think that there's thoughts that they're going to help the family back home, that they're going to do better, they're going to build a better life for themselves? In our community, it's the latter. We go to school to get a job, a good job. <laughs> so our intent is to bring industry to the schools so it works. Let me give you one last uh, example of that because, because you okay. bring up a very important subject. You know, the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities uh, happens every year. Uh, they have one conference where they bring all the HBCUs together. Uh, we had a night there. Uh, we brought in over 40 or so uh, companies uh, to include some large federal agencies like Homeland Security, NASA. We brought in a uh, large aviation agency. That, Google, right? Uh, the Walmarts of the world. These, these kinds of companies. We also brought in college presidents plus one or two if they wanted to bring them with them. We put them around round tables and we had the, the schools talk about what they needed and what graduates they were producing. And we had the companies talking about what they were looking for in workers. We're following up on that now and have been for the last three weeks because we want to connect the industry to the school. So we want a school like, I'll just pick one, Tougaloo, and let's say that Tougaloo is, 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 has uh, a lot of hope for imagery or pre-med or what have you, or hospital services. We want those companies to go to Tougaloo every year and commit to 10 to 15 interns, maybe mm. 20 to 30, depending on the size of the company. And we want them to do it every year over and over and over again so that we, begin, we can begin to diversify that company. And that company will trust what? Tougaloo. So that's how we envision the HBCU. That's how we envision them as places where talent is being made and that companies need it. So this is a mutual. This is not a giveaway. This is a mutual benefit. The company needs the talent. The school is producing the talent. They come together. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. This is not about this is not about a fancy degree. This is about a job. It's about it's about longevity and a and a good job to better yourself. Good and job. it's not I'm glad. I think I'm gonna put that in the in in the in the quote when I post it. It's not about the degree, <laughs> it's um, but like it's about the job, the good job. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. But I know we could go on and on and on. Um, like I said, after reading your bio, after going into uh, SFI, it's 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 a lot. So I definitely encourage people to go on and read for themselves as well to see what all it has to um what all you all have to offer. Um, trust me, you won't be disappointed. It's all beneficial and it's all to help. It's all to help us. That, that's the main thing. It's all to help us. Um, but Mr. Mark Brown, I definitely, definitely appreciate you for taking the time out to come on and spread some knowledge. Once again, we could be here all day if we just get into everything, but I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate what you all are doing over there. Um, and, and thank you. Just thank you for coming on. Thank you for giving us a platform to talk about these kind of things. Thank you for what you're doing. Congratulations on, on living your dream as an HBCU graduate. Uh, and I wish yes, you sir, all thank you. success. God bless you. Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Once again, everybody, you have been tuned in to another episode of Historically Black Sense, the premier digital platform for all things HBCU and D9. Be sure to go check out their website. We'll see you next time. Thank you.